You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, friends, Clever listeners. For the next few weeks, we're taking you on a little trip down memory lane. Clever launched in 2016, and since then, we've met so many talented folks and shared their fascinating personal stories that we thought we'd revisit a few of them. So we handpicked a selection of some of our favorites that are definitely worth a second listen. And if you miss them the first time, you are in for a real treat. We'll be back in September with some exciting and shiny new episodes for you. In the meantime, I hope you'll take us with you in your ears and in your hearts on all your summer adventures. I want to be with you on your bike rides, on your road trip, and lounging with you in a hammock. Okay, so we love and appreciate you a ton, and please do stay in touch on social. See you soon. An exhibition setting ultimately... You can create a thing, an original, a something that a visitor with a friend, they can go and look at that and discuss it while they're looking at it. Hey, everyone. I'm Amy Devers, and this is Clever. Today, I'm talking to graphic design giant Stefan Sagmeister. You know who I'm talking about. He's famous for album covers for the Rolling Stones, Lou Reed, Jay-Z, and bonus points if you know the band Skeleton Key. He won a Grammy for his work with Talking Heads and another Grammy for his work with David Byrne and Brian Eno. In 2012, he and Jessica Walsh formed the influential design agency Sagmeister & Walsh. And in 2019, they transitioned that partnership to their fine arts-based collaborations and handed off the commercial work to Jessica's newly formed agency, Ed Walsh. Stefan is known for provocative storytelling and immersive arts exhibitions, like The Happy Show, which is also a documentary film, and Beauty, a Cooper Hewitt National Design Award recipient. He's also an outspoken advocate of sabbaticals and has arranged his life to include one every seven years or so. I met up with him back in November at the 2019 Adobe Max Conference, where we sat down in the Airstream Podcast Lounge to enjoy a nice, intimate, pre-pandemic conversation. Here's Stefan. I'm Stefan Sagmeister. I am an Austrian designer who lives and works in New York City. I'm a designer because I really, really enjoy doing it and have so for a very significant amount of time. I think I designed the first things that got printed when I was 15. I'm now 57, so <laughs> you do the math. It's been a very long time that I've been doing this and somehow managed to still get a very big kick out of what I'm doing. Like right now, for example, like literally as in right now, as in today in the morning, I was excited to get up and just before I came to Max, work a little bit on some design ideas that I'm dealing with right now. So things are good. Yes, good. That's optimistic. (laughs) So we always like to get a sense of who you are by going all the way back to the very beginning. So born and raised in Austria, can Mm -hmm. you paint the picture of your childhood for us? Sure. Tell us about your family. I grew up in a very large family. I have, uh, we are six kids, three girls and three boys. Uh, I'm the youngest out of that bunch. So in many ways, probably grew up a little spoiled, come from a middle class family. Like my parents had a store, a store that was sort of the the big store in the small town. Okay. Uh, They sold clothes and we lived above the store. It's a very pretty town within the Alps on a very large lake. So you can, there's lots of swimming in summer, there's skiing in winter. It's an extremely safe town. So you could go to kindergarten by yourself. I mean, you had to watch the traffic and things, but ultimately mm-hmm. it's, you grew up uh, in a very good environment. I went to high school being not very happy. I went into sort of like an engineering version of high school that didn't really gel well with me and then it was a big deal to get back into regular high school and then before I actually was really able to choose and as soon as I could choose basically at a university level I of course chose to be a designer. While I was in high school I joined a small local magazine and there found out that I was 
enjoying doing their layout much more than the writing. Mm. So I took over layouting that magazine. So I was 15, 16, 17. Also was culturally quite active. So organized jazz concerts and demonstrations and festivals and things. And all of these things always needed graphics. Mm -hmm. Posters at the time, most, uh, most often. And considering I was already doing the layout, it was also clear, well, the layout or has to do the graphics. So I started to do these things and found it absolutely fascinating that you could come up in your bedroom with a poster, get it printed, put it up there, and then 800 people would show up for that thing. <laughs> and it literally, they, the only point where they could get that information was the poster you yeah, just found. So an effective form of communication. Totally. That was without me knowing at the time, unbelievably influential on me. I mean, for one thing on why I liked being a designer, but also moving forward, that complete awareness that everything that I do really has an effect, good or bad, like depending on how good or bad it is, the, the things that I do, but it actually, that it matters. Mm -hmm. So it was a fantastic education. It's a direct correlation to yeah. be able to see that. Were you self-taught at this point? Were you just figuring out how to make these posters on your own? And uh, You could call it self-taught. We had a wonderful local designer that I'm still friends with, who is now in his 80s, who here and there came by the magazine and showed us a couple of tricks, gave us his old, at the time, his old letter set sheets. Oh, uh, fun. And, you know, this is a pretty nice community. So there was another design studio that gave us their letter set sheets or we could get their type catalogs or like, you know, that here and there, like I remember going into their studio and I would just work on something for an afternoon and the main guy would give me tips. No, don't do it this way, do it that way. That works better than that. So there was help around. Okay, you had some mentorship. Yes. But, but but you also, it ignited something in you. You knew you wanted to study that yes. in school. And very important, the mentors were excellent. Ah. Like the quality of those two designers, specifically of one no, of both, was even when I look at it now, this was high quality, meaning these were what you would now call very accomplished, careful, considerate people who made it their job to do very good work mm -hmm. for whom also I would say that the pleasure of being involved in something that is interesting to them. One of them did many posters sort of in the more liberal world for politics, partly cultural things for whom that what they were doing played a bigger role than the financial aspects of the business. And I think all of these things were, of course, influential. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I can see that now. That makes a lot of sense. So you had a high standard of quality that you were introduced to the field with and also a passion that was a through line for the people that were your mentors. Yeah, I'd say so. And it's still, I think, still to this very day, if I go home, which I do quite often, if I look at the stuff that just hangs around, like the poster for the opera festival or the poster for this exhibition, because in Austria, as in many other European places, poster sites are still owned by municipalities, which means that you can get them as a cultural endeavor. You can get them very cheap. And so many of these poster sites are filled with cultural announcements. And I would go routinely, if I'm in Vienna, I would just basically pass by these round columns to see what's happening. And it's a pity that all of these sites, let's say like in New York City, they're all commercial. Even the ones that are semi-legally posted are kind of in the hand of poster mafia-like organizations. So a, in Hired New York City, you would hardly marketing. see a cultural poster unless it's big time commercial, let's say like a, whatever, the Lion King or something like this. But outside of that, like you wouldn't see a small theater being able to post anything that it would just couldn't afford it. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I'm thinking about growing up in my own small town. There were the official posters and then there were, there were the DIY punk yeah. rock posters. And both of them were equally influential in mm -hmm. terms of their mm -hmm. graphic communication. Yeah. And they also spoke to you so clearly, like, mm -hmm. that looks boring. That looks exciting and chaotic. Yes. That's yeah. where I want to be. <laughs> and of course, if there would be a movement like punk right now in New York, there wouldn't be a visual signifier of the same importance connected to it because there wouldn't be any posters. 
Right. They're, even the, the illegally posted ones are all taken over by big corporations. Some of them with the Hiring desire to marketing exactly sort yeah. of like to have a little street cred, like you know, you'll see iPod ads and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Okay, so I know you studied graphic design in Vienna, and you also have a master's in communications. I do. After I finished my studies in Vienna, I got a scholarship to do a graduate education at Pratt in mm -hmm. New York, which of course was fantastic because I basically had two fully paid years while being able to live in New York. And it was fantastic. I mean, I absolutely loved it. Would you have gone to New York otherwise? or After graduating from high school, I had gone on a very influential trip with my brother-in-law. And we had done a whole sort of a United States road trip and we gone New York, Florida, New Orleans, Chicago, and back to New York. And it was really New York that had captured my heart. And I sort of knew that in one way or another, that this is the city that fits me the best. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of like in an odd way, I felt that when I was just graduating high school, and I still very much feel that same way now. Probably comparable to, if you're looking for an apartment and you see 10 spaces and one just feels right. Mm -hmm. That's how New York felt to me. That makes sense. And you've been there ever since. Absolutely. Yes. And your communications degree, do you feel that that was relevant to you in terms of your storytelling or, or where did the communications fit in? I think it came handy to me in a sense that specifically in Vienna, just being in design school, mm -hmm put you in contact with people your own age with a very similar outlook on life who wanted to achieve similar things. So I think that in Vienna, I learned much more from my fellow students than I probably learned from the faculty. We had a student group. We are still friends now. I just visited two of them actually in Northern Italy and we kind of egged each other on. I think that that probably was the most significant part of the education too. I could have never, I don't think I could have done that on my own. And at the same time, some of my favorite designers, definitely my big mentor, Tibor Kalman, never went to design school. So it's clearly possible mm -hmm. uh, to do it. Or if you listen to the keynote speakers <laughs> yesterday from Adobe Max, if you know, to Dave Grohl, uh, it was all self-taught. So it's, it, I think it's all possible. I think it's more difficult. For one thing, I loved design school, specifically after high school that I hated. It was so pleasant to me to be able to study something that I was genuinely interested in. So that was felt extremely luxurious to me to start out with. But also, I think that in design school, things just also fall into your lap in a way. I mean, specifically if you're curious and you're, you, you have the, I had a strong desire to become better. I can say that. A yeah. very strong desire. So you, you were proactive about utilizing all of the facilities and resources yes. at your yeah. disposal. Yeah. And when you're in, yeah. when you're in that mindset, it is sort of like an amusement park of, totally. of good stuff to pull from. Yeah. I totally yeah. agree with you. And it's also an environment, an ecosystem of critical discourse and like minds to bounce your ideas off. And it can feel very, very fertile. I mean, I remember that because it became much less pronounced later. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, in design school, when you looked at something you did a month ago and then compared it to something you did a year ago, the stuff you did a month ago was just so much better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this is so pleasant. I mean, it was just so, oh, my God. You it's like see the incremental progress. Exactly. Ah. Yeah, yeah, totally. Which, of course, now that I've been doing it for so long, is so would be almost impossible to judge. Like, yeah. You know, like, is this thing that I'm working on right now truly better than this thing that I worked on five years ago? Like, it's, well, it's also so different. So it's, it's just, it's more difficult. Speaking of work, I'll, I'll take you back because you worked with some high profile agencies and then you founded your own mm -hmm. studio and you kind of started off with a focus on design for music. Mm -hmm. And as I was researching you, looking back at some of the record covers that you did, I pulled out my skeleton key. Oh, my God. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Excellent. That was such an influential band for me. And I didn't make the connection that you designed the that record cover, which is brilliant, by the way. I think you were nominated for a Grammy for that. Sure. That was a, a, 
a very much a fun band. Loved that band. I'm still friends with Eric. Oh, the, good. The, good. The singer of the band. And couldn't believe that was such a good band. And they never really broke into I the mainstream, know. which was just one of those odd unfair things that the music industry sometimes have. I totally For agree. For example, I think that in that way, design is much fairer. Mm. Like say, like if there is a design group out there of the quality of Skeleton Key, you'll hear from them. I mean, uh, <laughs> that, they'll be able to cut through because yes. they can on some level do it on their own. That was also back in a time where we're still sort of... It was pre-internet really. This yeah. was pre-self-publishing, pre that you could have your own record label. Yeah. And uh, it was at a time when the big labels really consolidated. And I think the first Skeleton Key record sold 30,000 units. Mm -hmm. And this was just not enough for the label. Yeah. Like the labels at that point were so big that 30,000 units were sort of like it was too dinky and it was felt like, oh, well, like maybe... It was amazing to me because I went to rehearsals of Skeleton Key. And when I was in high school, I was in bands myself. Mm -hmm. And it just was such an eye opener to me how much better they were than we used to be. <laughs> it was just like, there was like, to the point where if they are called a band, we were not. Right. Like we were in a different, like, it was just, these are different fields. Like, you literally couldn't compare it. And ultimately, they played with similar guitars and similar amplifiers than we did, just did so dissimilar things with them. I do want to talk, you know, eventually about your maturing and evolving relationship with music, because I know you took a sabbatical in 2000. Mm -hmm. That was a very nerve wracking decision for you. You've spoken openly about that, but it seems like it was an important one. Since then, you've expanded your studio into a full fledged creative agency, but also an art practice. And you've engaged in making some experimental work and physical exhibitions at museums. I was very pleased to be able to see the Happy Show in Frankfurt. Oh, excellent. Yes. Yeah. Speaking of live music, I kind of feel like your physical exhibitions are the equivalent of sort of playing live in front of an audience, a, an extension of that intimacy. Would you agree? I mean, what compelled you to go into the physical space when as a digital artist, you can deliver to so many people with such ease? It's a great question. And I think one that I never really answered properly. So in the case of the, the Happy Show, it originally started as a little side project of the Happy Film. On sabbatical, on the second sabbatical in Bali, it was clear we're going to start this thing about happiness in film form. It would have been like, a book would have been much easier, but it would have been boring because we've done many books before. And while we were working on the film, we were asked by the ICA, the Institute for Contemporary Art, to do an, a design exhibition, which I wasn't really interested in doing because we had already an exhibition about our work touring through Europe. Mm -hmm. And would have basically meant pick the same pieces again, put them again together, maybe in a somewhat different form, and now have it displayed at the ICA. And it just seemed like a boring exercise. And I asked, well, can we do the exhibition on, on happiness? Because that seemed like would be a new thing. And what I didn't count on then, and they agreed, but what I didn't count on was if the subject is relatable to an audience that you can really communicate something very personal and in a fairly intensive manner in an exhibition setting like that an exhibition setting ultimately you can create a thing an original or something that a visitor with a friend they can go and look at that and discuss it while they're looking at it. And in that sense, it's significantly different from film. It's significantly different from an online experience. I find that as a viewer, a deeply pleasing sensation. I go and see a lot of exhibitions and I don't go and see them because I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, oh, what do they do so that I could be influenced by it? Right. I go to see exhibitions Experience. for the pure joy of seeing exhibitions. And the Happy Show for in Philadelphia then was so well-liked by audiences 
And I have spoken to many, like I've spoken to a woman who had come 10 times, who sort of like took it as her meditation space, that it's traveled and it traveled heavily. Ultimately, I think it went into 10 stops around the world. I mean, it was all over the United States, but it also was all over Europe. And we had at the end of it, over half of a million visitors, which at that point was quite sensational. And when I talked to visitors, I felt that their experience in the show was a more significant one than, let's say, the people who went to see the Happy Farm. I somehow just, I don't have scientific numbers for that, but my gut feeling was that if you spent two or three hours in the show, that your impressions were deeper than if you sat through the film. And the show was easier to do than the film was. So I just felt this is a really valid medium. Mm -hmm. Before, like, if you were have asked me as a 35-year-old, are you interested in exhibition design? I would have said no, mm -hmm. not at all. Like, it literally left me as cold as anything. And I was actually surprised that there was a good number of New York design studios German, I think guys are like very situated New York design studios who always, or Pentagram, who had, were always involved in exhibition design. It was something that didn't touch me at all. And literally it was only through seeing how effective of a medium it can be in communicating also that it's possible to get a pretty tight attention of an audience for hours doing so. The focus, especially because by the time the attendee comes to the museum, they're intent on focusing. Mm -hmm. But then there's also, rather than like a corporate experience, design experience, mm -hmm. there's also a reverence, I think, that's built into the institution of the museum. And in, in particular, the experience of the Happy Show is a very personal exploration of yours that is blown up on a scale that we as the visitor are allowed to immerse ourselves in in a three-dimensional way. And there's something really touching about the scale, too, because it's almost like you're expanding your humanity to envelop us. No, oh, that's a very <laughs> nice thing to say. Well, uh, I'm not sure if that is true, but I thank you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, well, that's what it what felt like. Difference? I think that's yeah. part of what was so effective about it. It's a little bit harder when you're looking at a screen, although you can lose yourself in that. And then in a, in a digital transmission, it's great and it can affect culture because it seeps in and through osmosis, but there's something very visceral about, about that particular ex exhibition. Yeah. But, um, it seems like it might be something that, is in your future as well, continuing to do more work like that. What's the snapshot of your practice now? What does it look like? How do you divide up your energy these days? Well, I mean, we just made some fairly significant and big moves. Uh, basically, all of the commercial work is now on Jessica's shoulders. And it has been for a while, I would definitely say for the last year or two. And so it made sense to make that more official. Mm -hmm. So all of the commercial work that we used to do is really done under the moniker of End Walsh and is done under Jessica. There's a couple of things we are, have a look upon, but uh, okay. that's basically, that's hers. We're still going to do the beauty thing together. And the, the exhibition was now in Vienna and then in Frankfurt and is now moving on towards Hamburg and then ultimately going quickly back to my hometown in Austria and then go, going, moving on, but to France. So it's again, it's very popular. Uh, we've had a quarter of a million people in the first two iterations. So it's extremely, of course, it's extremely pleasing when you work hard and long on a subject that's of interest mm -hmm. to you that other people and you want to communicate that interest. And that was definitely the reason we did the exhibition that other people are also interested in that. I think that's uh, just fantastic. So that's opening in December 15 in Hamburg. And then basically, um, dealing with these exhibitions because we want them to look new in every space so that it's not just furniture that's put into a space, but that they really look site-specific. Yes. And then I'm dealing with other self-initiated projects. You know, I basically at 57 felt that while I think it's super important that People who love this are doing commercial work. And I think that the quality of commercial work is very important. I also felt I've done enough of it. Okay. And just basically move on. Not in, literally not in the way because I now look down upon it. Not at all. It is 
much more so I've done so much of I've done that mm -hmm. in the same way that I probably wouldn't do album covers now anymore because I've done that and I, why do it again now like mm -hmm. there's so much there's so many other interesting things out there in the world mm -hmm. and your curiosity is pulling you yeah yeah but also I think that I still very very much love the engagement of design mm -hmm. like you know i still think it's a super powerful medium that can do things yeah but wanna explore more of that notion that you know i think we've properly started like you know with the the happy film and the, mm -hmm. the exhibition and of course with beauty project but even before that you know we've done that large project on things i've learned in my life so far that uh, also was an exhibition but also a book or so that basically i think all of these projects have something to do with a personal stance being expressed using the language of design mm -hmm. And there was at one time in my life, I had a desire to become a film director. And then when I really thought that through, I thought, well, so I'm trying now to learn a new language to figure out if I have something to say in that language. Wouldn't it be smarter to use the language that I already know how to speak, design, and see if I have anything to say in that. And that's basically the manifestations of that. And there, of course, I can then try to do it in film, which we did in the happy form. Mm -hmm. But for example, I find it more pleasing to me, but I also think to an audience in the space of beauty, I found the exhibition medium to be more effective than the film medium would have been. And more by more effective, I mean, really on a rational point of view like meaning this was a big exhibition which was not cheap to do mm -hmm. so in the world of exhibition design we, we had a good budget mm -hmm. that same budget if we would have made a film with it it would have been the dinkiest of crappy documentary film budgets meaning totally nothing and i think as a film even though we would have if we would have given it our best, just by its choice of medium, would have had a much, much, much more difficult time cutting through. I can tell you the, the first museum in Vienna sent us their press folder, like the articles that were written about the exhibition, which was 650 pages. It would have been absolutely impossible to get that sort of feedback and that sort of significance within Austria or another market with a film. Mm -hmm. Like the film would just basically now, it's just incredibly difficult. And I applaud the people who are able to do it to be a small independent film producer. I think that many of the signs just go against you. Wow it is apparently still possible to be a small independent exhibition producer, even though, of course, we I couldn't even call that myself because we partnered with museums that did plenty of the heavy lifting as far as production is concerned. Sure, sure. But it sounds like you are looking at the system in its entirety. First of all, how do I use the language that I already know to communicate effectively? Sure. But also, how do I go through the channels that are kind of already open for me or will open mm -hmm. for me where I can make a bigger, more important message oh. in this way than I could in another medium where it will get trampled or... Totally. And that's an important thing to consider. I mean, it shouldn't keep you from making film, but it, if your ultimate goal is to have an effective communication, then you've got to choose... Those things play a role. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So... Along those lines, I want to talk about your creative process and, and I want to kind of understand how your brain works. Like, would you describe yourself as a systems thinker or nonlinear or linear? Or do you not think about it that way? Well, I would definitely say that I'm organized mm. for sure. Maybe, you know, growing up three miles from the German border had an influence in that way. And I love organized things, meaning that my desk normally is in a pretty good shape. I'm a good planner. Mm. I think part of the reason why the happy film turned out to be so difficult for me to complete was because we on purpose didn't have an ending or a script. 
and it felt made me feel very uncomfortable. Uh -huh. Like for me, it's a, a film that is storyboarded, that has a script, and every page of that script is storyboarded. <laughs> is like a thing of beauty. <laughs> Tuesday morning, let's shoot. Uh, page you see all the gears a, turning, a, B, uh, and so on. Yeah, like, that's definitely. Like I can deal with that. Tuesday morning, let's have the camera running. And we don't know what's actually happening is an uncomfortableness for me. So I'm not sure if that answers your question already, but I'm, I would say that in the, in the world of planners and ad hocers, mm -hmm. I'd be the former for sure. But I'm extremely aware of the possibility and the beauty of the unplanned journey mm -hmm. and here and there forced myself to go down that road with very often good results. So from the pure resulting point of view, I should do it more often. Uh -huh. It's just that it's uncomfortable. So. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, I'm interested because even though it sounds like that engineering school that you didn't care for really did work its way into your DNA a little bit, you still always seem to have grasp of the ephemeral, unpalpable humanity of things that seem to take a, a, a higher vantage point, a larger view to find I mean, that might not come through planning. I mean, I would say like, you know, I grew up in an Austria of the 70s and 80s that were still very much influenced by, I would say, Swiss modernism. Mm -hmm. So the objectivity grids being very tight with things don't bring yourself into it uh, sort of like a more like a, I would say a cold or more corporate sort of feeling and mm -hmm. I had always felt I think in in the beginning definitely in my gut later on I had uh, proper explanations for it that this is not the most effective way of communicating that I would, that I myself enjoy being communicated by somebody I recognize as a human being rather than being communicated to by a machine. And so much of, I would say, 70s and 80s modernism basically tried to deny its humanity mm -hmm. and tried to be very on purpose, sort of like, let's make everything look like it's been done by a machine. Now, if I if we look at this from the corporate point of view, if I call up a company and all I get is a machine that tells me press two, press three, press four for this and that, I'm extremely unhappy and I would think that most people are. Mm. And I feel that these pieces of printed communication or online communication that go down that route of the very cold do something very similar than these answering machines or these automated machines do when you call. So it's not something that... I would either want to be involved in, right. but also not something that I just think is an effective way of dealing with communication. And so I've always tried to communicate more emotionally, or at least that it would be clear that this thing that you look at has been made by a fellow human being mm -hmm. rather than by a machine. <laughs> yes. And that, uh, I think always had to seem, seem to work. And I think an, a very important, very important ingredients in that was a side effect of keeping the studio small. Meaning I myself always wanted to keep the studio very small. I had a mentor. Tibor Kalman, I mentioned him before, who told me when I opened the studio that, and I asked him for advice of what I should watch out for. He said, basically, the only thing that's difficult in running a design studio is how to, to figure out how not to grow. Everything else is super easy. And I had always taken that advice and a side effect of not growing or definitely at least not growing at the speed that the amount of clients would allow was that we were able to pick and choose because there were more clients around than we could possibly do. And of course, we picked the ones that we felt a kinship to, that were products that we used ourselves or that we thought had definitely a reason to be in the world. And that had the side effect that we didn't have to lie. Because yes. if we did something promotional yeah. and we said, this is really good water, it was our favorite water. And that made things so much more 
pleasurable for us also because if you're already working with a product that you love, it's fun to research it. Normally, products that you love are made by people that are somewhat similar in thinking. So if you have, if you're in meetings, it's much more fun. It's like a, there's a kinship there. Yes. It's just so much better for everybody involved, including the audience that gets that they're not being lied to. That yes. gets that this is somehow a more truthful piece of communication. And they know. I, intuitively, they pick up on it for sure. I know even in just having these podcast conversations, when there's genuine chemistry there, the audience can feel it. They And they feel like they're in the room with us. I have a friend who did a cat food advertisement. And he very, very, very much is a cat person. Uh-huh. And his cat food advertisement had... I forgot now, but last time I checked, it had 16 million views, unpaid views on YouTube. Because people who have cats really understand <laughs> that somebody of their ilk yeah. made that thing. And when you see the ad, it is 100% clear that no dog lover made the thing. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> and meaning, how great is that? Mm -hmm. It's He has fun doing it because he loves cats to start out with. So for him doing an ad for it is completely makes sense for his life. The ad is going to be much better because of it. The people who see it, even the non-cat people like me, get a little kick out of it because you can see there is some sort of truth about cats being revealed here. And, and the cat people who buy it like, love oh, it anyway. Yeah, but it helps the non-cat people kind of understand what it is that makes cat people cat people. It's like, oh, totally. okay, yeah. I kind of get it now. Yeah. So you've famously taken sabbaticals mm -hmm. around every seven years or so. And in doing so and in speaking about it, you've become a de facto champion of mm -hmm. sabbaticals. And I've done a few of these podcast interviews where other creatives are taking sabbaticals. So it's becoming a normal thing. So props to you for that uh, public service. I appreciate it. <laughs> My Question to you is, what do you think, what message are creatives sending to society by normalizing the sabbatical in their work? I think an excellent one. Here is my thing. Like in the beginning, I, of course, thought this was just something that I needed. And this was very peculiar to me. Mm -hmm. In the research for the happy film and the happy show, I found that many of my own peculiarities that I thought were very specific to me were unbelievably widespread and completely common to a Universal. lot of other people yeah. who just didn't hear that much about it. And other than realizing that I was much less special than I thought <laughs> that I was, I also felt then uh, through experience that the sabbatical works for a lot of people. In the beginning, I always sort of like was a little meek about it and said, I can't really recommend it to anybody else. Like it worked for me that I can say. And then I did a talk for Ted and Ted, because their site is so big, was seen by millions and millions of people. I started to run into more people, sometimes on the street, but sometimes at conferences who said, oh, I saw your Ted talk and oh, I actually took it seriously and I made a sabbatical too. And of course, my next question would be, how was it? Mm -hmm. And I've now talked to dozens of these people and every single one had shiny eyes. <laughs> when they when they powerful. talked about it. Yes. <laughs> Everyone was just like the best thing that ever happened to me. Like how fantastic was that? And the, the way they expressed these sentiments made it very clear to me, yes, this worked. And when we talked a little more, it also became clear to me that these people came from extremely different walks of life. I talked to poor people, to rich people, to people who ran their own studios, to people who were in a corporate setting. I talked to people with families and without families. I talked to people who had taken their families on sabbatical. So it seemed to work for everybody. I think that I would have a couple of caveats. I think one is you should only do a sabbatical after you've worked in your field for a while. I wouldn't recommend it to a student. I mm. think like you should basically, I think that part of the things that become valuable in a sabbatical might also come out of the little suffering that you have during your regular day-to-day -day things. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't go after 
outschooled into sabbatical. I think it probably works best for people where ideas play some role in their world. Meaning if you, I don't know, if you're working at a menial job, putting widgets into boxes, then you probably would love to, would enjoy the time off. But if your desire is to go back and doing widgets into boxes, probably the sabbatical might not be helpful. Right. But for most other people, I think there's now so many jobs out there. And that's, I'm not just talking about the tiny little world that, you know, is often described as the creative industries. Mm -hmm. That is, that would be true as well for banking, as much as it is true for politics, for anything where ideas and concepts play a role. I think it would be very helpful. And don't you think by normalizing the practice of taking a sabbatical and notifying your clients and being outspoken about mm -hmm. it, that it sort of sends the message to society that we are not bottomless wells that can be squeezed <laughs> dry, that we're taking our agency back in terms of, and I, I mean this for people in all industries mm -hmm. where concepts and ideas are important. We're taking our agency back and we're taking care of ourselves because those wells are things that we need to be managing their mm -hmm. refilling of. And if we leave it up to you, you will just pump from the well until it's completely yeah. depleted. And I think that very some very smart companies basically do versions of those sabbaticals. Yeah. Like, you know, Google has that famous 25% that you can work on something that you're really interested in. Yeah, I think 3M was kind of the pioneer Three, of exactly. that. Yeah, Very true, very true. And it worked extremely well for those two companies uh, that... Uh, so yes, I can, uh, meaning I can only recommend it from the bottom of my heart. I can, without any doubt, say that my own life and my career would have looked very different, very different from what it became if I wouldn't have taken a sabbatical. I mean, there's even a possibility that I would still be in the studio in New York designing CD covers and being wondering why business is so bad. <laughs> <laughs> So in many ways, they perhaps helped you keep your perspective dialed in. I'm just genuinely curious when you have a career with the longevity of yours, but also the extreme highs, you've enjoyed some of the highest accolades and celebration and popularity. You've also, I mean, when you get that big, you become a target for criticism and controversy. And so you've run the gamut, full spectrum. How do you work with your ego? when the highs are so high and the lows can be so low? Hmm. I mean, I'm definitely not immune to criticism. I think I can take it very well when it comes with the notion of betterment. Mm -hmm. I think uh, then I'm extremely inviting of it. And I get that sort of criticism where somebody takes me aside and say, I think you should rethink this or I actually what you did here was not quite right. Or I think that that's extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. There's other criticism that sort you feel the, what we learned in art school to take the feedback. And if it's coming from a place of construction, then it's it's really useful. Very. Yeah. yeah. And it's something that I think you can put a platform on. Like, you know, I'm, uh, since years now, I'm basically criticizing work mm -hmm. on Instagram that mm -hmm. people sent to me. And I myself try to be as constructive as possible. That doesn't mean that it's always positive. Like, I also have quite negative criticism, but I try that negative criticism not to be snarky. And but to be useful. To be useful. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the comments on my feed, there are almost all, this very, very few exceptions, almost all in that same vein. Okay. Like that basically that the whole community tries to make that person who sent that thing in to give her or him helpful tips on how to increase it. Some are better than others, obviously. Sure. And the person will have to select which one of those they like the best. And some are against what I had advised, which is all, of course, fine. But you can feel the overall desire is to make that person a better designer. And that, of course, I think is, is, is great and fantastic. There's another piece of criticism out there where you feel that the person who delivers it wants to make a point or wants to in sometimes put themselves above 
the person who criticized or there's all sorts of other reasons out there that are much less helpful that uh, sometimes get under my skin anyway, but I try not to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I guess the, yeah. the perspective is helpful there in terms of understanding the intention and where it's coming exactly. from. Yeah. Okay, so we need to wrap things up, but you've given so many interviews over the course of your life. Is there anything that you want to say that nobody's asked? Hmm, I think I've been asked a lot, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I can quickly talk about the stuff that's interesting to me right now. Yeah, I'd love that. Basically, I'm working on things that have to do with long-term thinking. Because I find that specifically us, let's say, in the designy, artsy more intellectual world seem to be very much in love with, even though we criticize the short-term thinking of politicians or of CEOs, we ourselves are influenced by short-term media outlets like Twitter or cable TV news and see the world in many ways from a short-term perspective, which can be incredibly gloomy. And if you look at many things that are long-term developments, things look actually quite good. And I'll give you, an, uh, give you a quick example. Like I was at a fantastic artist residency this year for two months in Rome. And this was for the artists, designers, architects, archaeologists working on their own somewhat Rome-centric projects. So it was fantastic. And one of the husbands of one of the artists told me over dinner that he thinks what we're looking at right now is the end of the liberal democracy. That there's Trump and Johnson and Salvini was, was still in place in Italy, uh, Urban and so on. Like, but we're looking at it's the end of liberal democracy. And because I was already working with a lot of long term data, I looked it up and I found that liberal democracy started around 1800, and there were three, the UK, the US, and uh, France. And then from 18, so from 1800 to 1850, there were three. From 1850 until 1900, there was another seven joint. Then the next 50 years, another 10 joints. And from 1950 to 2050 joint, now another 11 joints. So we now have 87 democratic nations. What we are looking at right now is for the first time, more than half of humanity lives in a democratic system. We are looking at the extreme golden age of liberal democracy. And so he could not have been, and this is a smart person, this is a lawyer, smart guy. He could not have been more wrong. And I think that this sort of doom and gloom situation is wildly spread among many of us. And while there are serious obstacles to overcome, global warming being, of course, at the extreme center of this, I find that these obstacles are easier to overcome when we are also aware of the accomplishments. And if we start from a more positive outlook, then if we start from everything is going to hell and we are at the end of the world anyway, kind of perspective. <laughs> yes. So that's what I'm working on. I, lo I love it. And thank you for your optimism, which is desperately needed right now. And I agree with you. If we feel like we're already spiraling into a flaming meteor um, in the proverbial handbasket on its way to hell, it's really hard to reverse that momentum. But if we look at it from the middle of the golden age of liberal democracy, then we can ride this out as a bit of turbulence and we can make some course corrections. And yeah. Perfect. Right on. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so before uh, we wrap it up, tell our listeners where they can find you and keep track of all your latest projects. Well, uh, you can, of course, always follow me on Instagram. I'll post something that I find beautiful that a uh, somebody who is also on Instagram sends to me every day. If you want to, you can go out and buy the book on beauty that Jessica and I published uh, with Fidon. If you happen to be in Europe anytime soon, uh, go and see on December 15th in the Museum von Kunst und Gewerbe in Hamburg. The beauty show is opening and 
then I have a whole schedule of various talks all around the world, but I have not the idea. Yeah, yeah, idea. We'll, we'll find those on your website. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> we'll post that in the show notes. Thank Perfect. you so much. This has been really, really enlightening and delightful. I really appreciate Same it. Same here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening. To see images of Stefan's work and read the show notes, click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app or go to cleverpodcast.com where you can also sign up for our newsletter. Subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. If you would, please do us a favor and rate and review. It really does help us out. You can find all of our past episodes in our archive on our website. Find the link in our show details. We also love chatting with you on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Clever Podcast, and you can find me at Amy Devers. Clever is produced by 2VDE Media with editing by Rich Straffolino and music by L1011. Clever is proudly distributed by Design Milk.